So it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce Maria Avila Arcos, who um, did her undergraduate degree at the National Laboratory of Genomics for Biodiversity in Irapuato, Mexico. This is uh, so she got her bachelor's in um, genome sciences at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. And uh, then she did her PhD in paleogenomics at uh, the University of Copenhagen. Uh, she did a little bit of postdoc work there as well. And then um, also at Stanford University. Um, currently she's an assistant professor in the International Laboratory for Human Genome Research in Queretaro, Mexico. Um, and this is part of, uh, this is also part of UNAM. And so it is a great pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I can't visit uh, ASU. I was looking forward to it, but, well, we all know uh, what happened. So, so we are going to try this now, and I hope you uh, find this interesting. It's, it's unpublished work. Um, and suddenly it becomes, I guess, very relevant during these pandemic times, right? Because I want to tell you about how we are using ancient DNA, how we use ancient DNA to identify uh, viral pathogens uh, in uh, colonial times in Mexico. So before I jump in, I want to tell you a little bit more of, of where I come from because you have probably never heard of it before. Uh, it's the International Laboratory for Human Genome Research in Querétaro, as Anne mentioned. Uh, this is our building. We are around two hours north or three hours north of Mexico City. And um, in this center, it's, it's quite new. We are at the moment five junior faculty, uh, mostly females. We have four to one female radio, which I think it's unique. I like female to male radio, which I think it's unique. And we also um, collaborate quite a lot between us. Um, so me and Diego, we both do population genetics and he's more on the th theoretical side, computational side, whereas I do also some uh, experimental work. Alejandra, she works in gene regulation, Lucia, G genome evolution, and Daniela on cancer bioinformatics. And I mentioned this just so you know that we are doing uh, a lot of genomics work in this little corner in Mexico. And uh, well, as I said, this is it's a brand, well, not so brand new, five years ago we started. And uh, hopefully you'll hear more from us in the future as we publish our work. So in particular, my research, my research line uh, involves studying the changes in the genetic diversity of the Mexico population through time. I find this uh, very interesting because we have a very particular um, population history. Uh, we, we know we had in the past, this is of course not to scale, but it's past to present. We, I, I'd like to show this uh, figure from a student, uh, Viridiana, where she kind of depicts in colors the amount of genetic variation we would expect to have in the past, like in native populations in Mexico. Um, but then after co European colonization, and the pathogens that came with them, there was uh, a drastic bottleneck that reduced the genetic diversity by a lot. And now I the variation that went through, passed through the bottleneck and the uh, Europeans and Africans. Um, oh, I got a message saying my internet connection is unstable. So if you lose some of what I'm saying, just let me know and I can repeat it. So apologies. Okay. So to understand this process, um, what I have different lines of research, I'm very interested in understanding first this part, like how were pre-Hispanic populations, genetically speaking, how was their diversity before the bottleneck? So we have a project on that, that's the paleogenomics uh, of pre-Hispanic Mexico. I'm also interested in this very understudied aspect of, of our genetic and population history, which is the contribution of Africans to our gene pool. It's been neglected for uh, 
hundreds of, of years, basically. And uh, it's only gaining attention recently. And I'm very interested in, in, interested in studying this part. Uh, what, what's the genetic legacy of, this, uh, of that mixture with Africans? I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, I'll mention it briefly. And more recently, I became very, very interested in specifically the role of pathogens. So I was studying human populations, but realized the big impact that pathogens had. And I wanted to learn more about these new pathogens. What were they, right? So I want to thank upfront these three uh, people who are key in, in the project I'm gonna mention to you today. So I want to mention them since the beginning. Miriam Rao is a PhD student in the lab. Um, Axel Guzman, he was an undergraduate student and he was actually the brain behind this project. He actually wanted to study ancient viruses when I thought these were not interesting. And I, of course, I was very wrong. Um, so it was his motivation and enthusiasm about the topic that actually drove this project. And then uh, Daniel Blanco Melo, he's a virologist who I asked for help when Axel wanted to work with viruses. So he's a colleague, he's in Mount Sinai in New York City at the moment. So these three people are key and I want you to see their faces and note that this is mostly their work. So I want to talk today as the title uh, told you, it, uh, we're gonna focus on ancient viral genomes and if we have time, I want to mention very, very briefly, very cool, exciting results, very recent results on oral pathogens, bacterial oral pathogens as well, uh, but we'll see. So as a background, we know, uh, what we know about infectious diseases in, in the past in Mexico varies a lot depending on whether they are before or after European colonization. So for pre-Hispanic part, uh, for the pre-Hispanic period, they are sparse uh, um, uh, studies that report cases like trypanomatosis, trypanomatosis, or periostitis, and, and they're very sparse. Uh, and periostitis is not very specific of a infectious uh, specific pathogen. It, we just know that it's a inflammation of the membrane that covers the bone. So it's very unspecific. We cannot say what pathogen caused it. And there are some reports here and there and very sparse we don't know much about this in the pre-contact uh, period. There's also some uh, evidence of TB, as some people in the audience may know, um, but it's very sparse in pre-Hispanic times. Uh, and it's very sparse compared to the colonial era, right? Uh, once the Europeans arrived, they brought, uh, there were a lot of epidemic outbreaks uh, throughout the country, uh, including smallpox, probably the first one, uh, then measles, mump, um, type of fever, and among others. And this purple one that I show some places here, this is just to give you an idea, um, it was a coccolistli. And this is something we don't really understand what kind of pathogen it was. And I'll tell you more about it in a second. So this is just to contrast the, the scarce evidence in the pre-Hispanic period versus the vast evidence in the colonial period, right? And to give you some numbers as well uh, about this drastic uh, population decline, uh, it is estimated, it depends who you ask, but it is estimated that the population in the Central Valley of Mexico, so Central, Central Mexico, by the time the Spaniards arrived was between 20 and 30 millions and that the epidemics, epidemics caused by different pathogens basically decimated the population. So it, re it was reduced by 90% according to some estimates. So we have this evidence of smallpox, uh, the very first large epidemic causing 8 million deaths. And then these two outbreaks uh, in 1545 and 1576 of this coccolistli, this mysterious pathogen. But uh, according to uh, records, it was responsible of millions of deaths in very short time span. So we know this from some um, historical records, especially from Codex. And uh, 
Well, the question remains, what exactly was Kukulisli? Right, we know from also from records that it was a hemorrhagic uh, fever, but we don't know exactly what was it. So we're gonna go back to this. This is a, sort of a background. And if we want, if we want to study ancient DNA, which is uh, what I do to, to kind of find uh, pathogens uh, in, in the past, we have two main substrates. Um, both have uh, advantages and limitations. So what we can use is uh, use bone lesions. So there are some pathogens that leave lesions in the bones. And these are very obvious. This is, I think, TB and the trypanomatosis that I showed you. So different uh, uh, pathogens leave very specific or specific marks in the bone. So we can go after those lesions and try to recover DNA from them. Uh, but then not all pathogens leave bone lesions, right? Especially if, path if path for pathogens that kill you like in very sh short time periods. I mean, there's you don't have to infect the bone to affect any bone. So when we're interested in those type of epidemics, the um, substrate that could be uh, most informative are actually, could actually be teeth. And that's when you assume you have a systemic infection because in, in the teeth, the root of the teeth is vascularized. So blood comes through. So if you have a pathogen that's infected you so badly that it's spread, spreading through, through your blood, you would expect to find it in teeth. So what we use is, uh, is teeth, but when the archeological context is suggestive of an epidemic, right? So there are different indicators in the archeological context that can, that can uh, inform you of, of a past epidemic, like the way the bodies are disposed and other markers. And um, there's been some studies following this approach. So I will tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, and I know there's time for questions at the end, but if I'm not being clear on some aspect or, or you want to ask something that very moment because you think it would help a follow through, just stop me, I'm happy to stop. Okay, so what is uh, the uh, current number of ancient DNA studies for pathogens? Well. Uh, it's, it's a bit larger now than the report from last year, a review from last year, but um, there's been hundreds of ancient pathogen genomes reconstructed on, using ancient DNA, uh, using the substrate I mentioned, plus others, uh, some include skin or preserved tissues from museums, for example. And this is more or less a time span. And you will see that there is uh, a bias in European uh, countries or Eurasian countries. Um, most of the studies have focused on, uh, on plague, characterizing an ancient plague, the Black Death, and a few studies outside Europe. So I will tell you a bit more about these two in Mexico. So there's two studies using Mexican samples, uh, though they were carried out abroad. Uh, one, well, both are the, from the colonial times. And one was reporting uh, this uh, Salmonella enterica, uh, which causes enteric fever from uh, a site. Actually, these are, the colors are uh, like this should be Oaxaca. So this should be the, this is belongs to this. So sorry, the colors are the other way around. And another one, another study, Anthroponema pallidum, that causes congenital syphilis uh, from a uh, place in Mexico City. So these are the two studies, both are bacterial pathogens. So we wanted really to, because we have this uh, vast archeological record in Mexico, this interesting history, which ma was marked by, uh, by pandemics, also like uh, terrible pandemics and uh, infectious diseases. We wanted to do this in situ in Mexico. And uh, the same is for ancient viral genomics. Uh, most of the studies are carried out abroad, none in Mexico regarding viruses. And if you remember one of the graphs I showed you at the beginning, the first outbreak that killed 8 million people was from smallpox, which is caused by a virus. And it's actually a DNA virus. So um, we wanted to, to 
study both aspects, like viral and ancient bacteria, try to recover their DNA, and, uh, and learn more about pathogens in this colonial period. So yeah, this was our goal to identify ancient pathogens, uh, ancient pathogen DNA in pre and post contact archeological samples from Mexico. Um, so we started with this collection. Uh, we recovered ancient DNA from archeological remains belonging uh, from two sites. One is from a hospital, a colonial hospital. This was actually the first hospital in the new Spain that was dedicated to native people. And what was uh, very interesting, my colleagues, Julie Wesp, and she's a bioarchaeologist, and Dr. Marcela Sandoval, she, she is uh, a, a, genom a paleogenomicist as well from Copenhagen. Well, she's Mexican, but she was doing PhD and now postdoc in Copenhagen. So uh, Julie, what she found and other st uh, studies found was that in this hospital, the remains of this hospital, the collection is around 600 individuals. There were some individuals of African ancestry suggested by teeth dental modification and other osteological markers. So she had this question of why uh, if they are African, why they, we can find them in this hospital that was supposed to only serve the natives. So that was his, uh, a study she developed for her postdoc. Uh, but then me and Marcela, we were more interested in investigating the ancestry and then, and then I was interested in the pathogens of uh, these individuals. So just to tell you uh, more about this site, so this is Hospital San Jose de los Naturales in Mexico City. And we studied 22 individuals from this collection. And then we had access to another collection also in Mexico City in Coyoacán. We had access to seven individuals from uh, it's called La Conchita site, and in, it's next to a, a chapel. And they were also thought to be uh, that, well, the historical records of the, of the church, of the chapel, they report uh, also numerous epidemics, and also the disposition of the bodies uh, suggested that uh, there was an epidemic. Right. So we started with these samples. Um, for this project. And I should remind you before we move on some of the features of ancient DNA, although some of you might be already familiar, it's very difficult to work with ancient DNA. The DNA breaks uh, with time. So we are left with very short fragments uh, compared to modern DNA. Uh, we have something that we call damage, which is that uh, cytosines deaminate, especially at the ends of the DNA fragments, the losing ends, so the single-stranded ends. Uh, they're very, uh, they go through this deamination very easily, so we call this damage. And we have to be very careful to not be confused when we study ancient DNA and we see certain variants, we have to be sure they're not due to damage, but real variants. And uh, we also have uh, a lot of contamination. This is what we, uh, fear the most and where there are two types, when I may say contamination, I can refer to environmental uh, contamination. So the DNA, I, I put it here in black, the DNA that just comes with the sample as you extract the DNA from a sample, it's like a metagenomic experiment, like a sole metagenomic experiment. And all the microorganisms that colonize the sample after a post-mortem, post so you, always end up with this environmental DNA or environmental contamin contamination. And if you're not careful, you can contaminate with DNA floating around in your lab. So we call this the lab uh, DNA. And the worst part is when, it, when it's human, if you're studying humans, sorry, if you're studying humans and you contaminate with human DNA, if you're not careful enough, well, this contamination is really problematic. So when we study DNA, we have this analogy of trying to find a needle in the haystack. But when you study pathogen DNA, it's like trying to find like a spot in the needle in the haystack. So it's very difficult. Uh, and for these reasons, we have to use special facilities and take a lot of cautions to study ancient DNA. So for example, here in uh, my institution, this is what we call the modern DNA lab. All the modern DNA work is done here. 
and the human paleogenomics lab, uh, we have an isolated tiny little room where we do the DNA extractions and library construction. And it's very important for us uh, that this is isolated. Um, so we avoid contamination with modern DNA here. And while there are a lot of measures, this is how it looks more or less from the inside, how people have to dress up. I'm sure you've seen some pictures of the of similar to this from Anne's uh, lab. So just to show you that we have something uh, smaller in Mexico also. So the workflow for this project was as follows. We started with, with teeth, as I mentioned. We extract DNA from this. Uh, we do uh, double-stranded DNA libraries. Uh, and these libraries, we sequence them in these machines that are called next generation sequencing machines. And these uh, go out thousands and millions, millions of reads of sequence reads. So with these reads, we can do two things, look at the human fraction, what's human, and do some analysis on the human part. And we can also do some taxonomic profiling on the non-human reads and try to identify pathogens. So uh, we do this taxonomic profiling and from these profiles, we look and see if we can find pathogens of interest. If we do, we apply this technique that I will tell you a bit more about it later, we call in solution capture. So this is basically just try to fish the DNA, fish out the DNA from the pathogens of interest. Uh, we fish this DNA, we sequence this uh, captured DNA again, and then we, um, we reconstruct the genomes, we map against a, a reference, we see if we validate that it's ancient using these damage signatures that I mentioned earlier, do a lot of quality control, consensus genome reconstruction, uh, and some phylogenetic analysis, among other things. But this is more or less the workflow we follow. Um, and well, just jumping to the results. The uh, first result, as we expect from almost every ancient DNA experiment, most of the, of the DNA of the sequence reads are not human. So uh, in, in our studies from the hospital sample, these are the hospital samples, these are the Koyakan samples, and in orange we have the human fraction and in yellow the non-humans, and we sequence between two to uh, four to 20 million reads per sample. We were, uh, as we expected, the human fraction is very small. Sometimes you cannot even see it in these bars. It is very, very little. But with that little um, human uh, DNA, we do some QC analysis. We also to control for human contamination. So we look at that human fraction to see if there's contamination from modern humans. And we couldn't find, we found neglectable levels. So Basically, we can say there's, there's no human contamination and that's important when we look at the human pathogens as well, right? So basically we have to analyze millions of reads that are not human and make the profiles to identify viruses or, or uh, pathogens of interest. And I'm gonna show you the results for some viruses that uh, we were interested in. So these are samples from the hospital. These are all the, uh, all the individuals, all the sequence libraries from these individuals in the first Run. And this is done with a program called Megan that shows you like a, an enrichment of certain species and uh, per library. So just to show you here, here in the hospital, I'm highlighting uh, one individual, one library from one individual that had uh, comparatively more reads assigned to ortho than a virus. I will go back to that in a second. And uh, four libraries that had higher uh, proportion of reads uh, belonging to erythroparboviruses. Right? So this was interesting for us. And there was, um, I, well, just to say this word replicate. So this is actually the same individual. So three individuals with this fraction, uh, this erythroparvovirus DNA enriched. And there was another individual from the Coyoacan collection who also had a high proportion of erythroparvovirus treats compared to the rest of the samples. So we were very interested in this and we wanted to uh, look in depth. And to do this, we 
designed a capture enrichment strategy. So basically, um, and this was designed by Axel and Daniel, we have single-stranded RNA probes that um, have biotin, uh, and these are complementary to the regions of interest. So in this case, the regions of interest are the viral sequences, right? So here are shown like in green, for example, and the blue is everything else. So because these are complementary, uh, this can hybridize, and then you have some magnetic bits that are coated with a streptavidin, which is uh, that which binds uh, very strongly to the biotins in these baits. So you can pull them basically like using a magnet and you can fish them out and wash the rest and then sequence, um, sequence the thing that hybridize. So we, we wanted to do this for some viruses and um, because we had a lot of room, virus genomes are very small. So we decided, okay, instead of just capturing one or two viruses of interest, let's use the space we have in this kit with this company, Arbor Biosciences, to capture other potential viruses of clinical relevance. So these are viruses that my colleague Daniel was interested in, and he had some reasons to include them, to want to include them in this, um, in this capture uh, kit. Uh, and here, just to show you, these are different viral families and the viruses in, this family, in these families. And sometimes we were only targeting some few genes and sometimes whole genomes. So for the case of the uh, hepatitis B and B19B, I will tell you more about this in a second, the, the genomes were very small, like 3 and 5.6 kb. Uh, but we had room for capturing more if there were more viruses in there. So yeah, I just want, uh, we will focus on these two in a second. So, okay, we applied this method and we enriched, um, we, we did the experiments were uh, successful. So um, successful retrieval of targeted viral DNA. So I'll show you here, uh, these are the four, some four individuals. And this is kind of a proportion of reads, the proportion of reads in this uh, scale with colors of different viral families. So uh, the first thing, the very first thing that we were very initially interested in was that all had this pox virida, so this, this was a small pox. But after looking carefully, we realized that these were all mapping to one region in the, in the uh, smallpox genome that, was, that had some homology that was homologous to a region in the human genome that for some reason didn't escape the first human genome uh, filtering. So, and this had no signs of damage, so we discard this. But then we found these other instances, these hits that I showed you before to the uh, hepatitis B and uh, parvoviridae. And also these hits to herpes virus were also didn't have signatures of ancient DNA, so we discarded them. So this is how the proportion of hits look be before capture, so this is pre-capture. And then if I show you for each individual how the proportion look after capture, what well, we see this fraction was enriched. Uh, also for this individual and for, for all of them, for the viruses we were interested. The, Hepatnovirid A, which was uh, the hepatitis B, and parvovirid A. So um, this was very good for us. Uh, this, uh, the reads we retrieve after doing capture allowed us to reconstruct their genomes. So B19B is the parvovirus. I will talk a little bit more about parvoviruses in a second. Um, but just want you to, uh, to see that we recover three genomes. This is a, what we call a coverage plot. So this is uh, the genome and the positions in the genome. And this is the depth of coverage. So how many reads are covering each position in the genome. And you can see we recovered uh, most of the sequence of the reference, we covered most of the reference sequence between 92 and 98%. And a decent depth of coverage, so 3.1 to 15.2. So something that was very interesting, maybe you can see that is that at the very end of the virus, we had this increase in depth 
right? So why was this? When we uh, look at the structure of the genome of this virus, this is actually a single-stranded DNA virus. So actually our method was double-stranded DNA, so we, sh we shouldn't be able to recover single-stranded DNA. Um, but the ends are hairpin uh, loops, so double-stranded. These are inverted repeats. Uh, inverted repeat. Um, and we know that in when this virus reproduces, it uses this o, the polymerase uses this OH and, and uh, it has a, it's very complicated system, but basically it goes through a phase of double stranded DNA. So that's why we were actually able to recover fractions of this single stranded DNA because this virus, as it replicates, it's, it has some phases in double stranded DNA. And that also explains why we have this increased depth at the ends because this is a region in the genome that it's always in double strand. So that was interesting for the parvovirus, the three parvovirus uh, genomes. And then for the hepatitis B virus, uh, this is a circular genome. This is linear, linear genome and this is circular. Um, this is the depth and the distribution of the depth. And uh, we have some interesting pattern here, which is also very low depth here. And when we look at the structure of the genome, uh, this is how hepatitis B looks. Uh, it's double-stranded, most of it, but then it has a single-stranded region because viruses have these weird structures and also a RNA tail. Um, so this uh, coincides with this very low depth we have here. There are other regions with low depth and uh, we have some ideas of why we could be having low depth at other regions. But just to show you that we also have uh, a decent depth for the double-stranded part of the hepatitis B genome, uh, ancient virus, uh, hepatitis B genome. And just to show you, this is some standard figures we do in ancient DNA. Sorry that it's a small and there's a typo there. Um, but basically we want to see this enrichment of C2T mismatches and G2A at the ends of the read. So this is the position in the read. And this is the frequency at which we observe these uh, mismatches for all the individuals. These are in the same graph. And basically this is just for us to know that is or be confident that it's ancient and not some modern contamination. So, okay, so we have these four ancient, uh, these four genomes, we know they're ancient. And I'll just take a step back to tell you a bit more about the uh, parvovirus. So here I refer to it as B19B. Um, we know that it's common in kids. Uh, it's actually very widespread and it can be very mild or asymptomatic. Uh, the transmission is through the respiratory route. Uh, it's found in, it can be found in several tissues, but because it infects the precursor uh, cells of the uh, erythrocytes, erythrocyte, sorry, so the, blood, the red blood cells. So it, it infects the precursor, uh, precursor cells. Uh, it's found a lot in bone marrow, in liver, and sometimes in heart. Um, and it's, as I said, it can be very mild, but it can be, uh, it can cause severe conditions, especially in pregnant women. It can cause something that is called it drops fetalis, where uh, the, the liver, bone, and heart of the fetus are, um, are affected and can be lethal. Uh, it's very common in something called, the, well, the fifth disease is something very common in child where it's just a simple rash in, in the cheeks and it can cause nothing more than a few discom uh, small, some discomfort. And, but in certain conditions can be fatal uh, and because it, uh, it, it infects uh, the liver and the heart, it can cause hepatitis and heart failure. And as I said, it can be fatal combined with other conditions like immunosuppression anemia, malaria, heavy hemorrhages, and that's because, as I said, it infects these precursor uh, cells. So this is uh, about parvovirus. I didn't know anything about it before this project, so um, we'll, we'll go back why this is important in a second. So when we did the phylogeny of these parvoviral genomes, uh, using modern strains, uh, there is a phylogenetic reconstruction that suggests that there are three main genotypes. And these are distributed 
uh, like this. So genotype one is globally distributed. So I just tell you the color code. In blue and pink, in black are all the modern strains. Um, in blue and pink are ancient strains from a different study from 2018 where they, where, where they also found uh, ancient fibroviral genomes, so B19, B genomes. So this genotype one is globally distributed. It's found everywhere in the world. Genotype two is thought to be endemic of, of Europe and only Northern Europe. And it's thought to, be, to maybe be out of circulation. It's been only found in all people from Scandinavia. Uh, and it was found in some ancient strains. Uh, and lastly, the genotype three, which is mainly found in Africa. And in red, we have the samples from this study. So this is uh, one of the individuals from the hospital. And this is another individual from the hospital and third individual from Coyoacan. So the three, str uh, the three samples from these individuals, uh, the three viral uh, genomes, fall within the genotype three variation, which is uh, original of Africa. And something similar happens with the hepatitis B genome that we sequence. So here, just to explain you, there are way more genotypes uh, for hepatitis B. And they are found in different places in the world, different genotypes in different places. But uh, in our study, we found uh, that this individual, the hepatitis B genome from this individual was clustering in genotype A. Genotype A is found in different places, but it's thought to be, it's found at higher frequency in Africa as well, higher frequency than in other places. And there are some, uh, some studies that suggest that it's actually, uh, that it actually originated in Africa. Um, so this was interesting to us, like we had these uh, individuals with skeletal markers suggestive of African origin, and then their viral genomes were also suggested uh, to be from Africa. So of course, one obvious analysis was to look at the genetic ancestry of the, of the host, since we have some uh, human DNA. So we do this using the standard uh, thousand genomes PCA, just to walk you through this. We have the Afri uh, modern African populations here, Asians, Europeans, and these are the Mexicans and Peruvians from the thousand genomes. So when we look at where our, our individuals fall in this PCA plot, so the B19V, the parvovirus infected individuals, uh, two fall here. A third one falls here, so it's more like a mestizo with ancestry from like native and uh, European ancestry. And the hepatitis B infected individual is also from Africa. So this, we start to draw some interesting observations from this. Uh, when we look specifically at one of the individuals, individual uh, 81, we know that he was a male adult uh, and had these markers, um, porotic hyperostosis and criba orbitalia, uh, which I can't tell from a figure, but Julie, my bioarchaeologist friend and colleague can. So she told us this individual, I noticed this, and interestingly, both are associated to anemia. And remember, this is an individual who had uh, the parvovirus. So um, it was interesting to, to see this association between these markers and the presence of anemia and the parvovirus. So also, this is the first observation of this genotype three in ancient samples. There's only one study uh, that they recover ancient uh, parvovirus genomes from Eurasian samples, and none of those were genotype three. And the few studies that exist in Mexico with modern samples, none has found genotype three parvoviruses. So this is a first. Um, and for this individual, the C4, which we think is, well, genetically it looks more like an admixed individual, we think that the chain of transmission had to involve at some point an African individual bring, uh, with, this, uh, with this virus. Um, so these were like the main observations for this study. And then the, the next question or obvious question is where were they born, right? So we know genetically they look African, three out of four, but we cannot know where exactly were they born, but from 
the DNA, right? So we need another strategy. This is using strontium isotope analysis. Um, so analysis, we compare the parietal, so bone and teeth, uh, the proportions of, of these strontium isotopes. And what we found, so this is for one, uh, for individual 81 and this for individual 240. So what we found is that the, the proportion of these isotopes in the teeth, which is more representative of where the individuals were born, um, for both it's uh, similar to um, values observed in West Africa. And their bones, so in this case was part of the parietal bone and the phalange, um, have intermediate, uh, intermediate values of between Mexico City Valley and Africa. So the, the values in bone are more representative of the places where you spend your, um, your last years. So this, is, this story tells us that these individuals were likely born, uh, most likely born in Africa. Um, so, well, this is, of course, I'm, I'm, maybe you don't need reminder of this, but just in case, we know that the arrival of Africans to Mexico was part of the transatlantic slave trade into the new Spain. And particularly, uh, well, this, this uh, period in history involved the forced movement of millions between 12 and some people, some 20 million people from Africa who were forcibly taken to the Americas. And uh, in the case of Mexico or New Spain then, the estimates are around 250,000 African individuals. And this is very interesting. When you look at the amount of African individuals in the New Spain compared to uh, European individuals, like the, uh, these are uh, the years. And for many years, like hundreds of years, there were more African individuals in the New Spain or Mexico than Europeans. Of course, the native population was uh, larger, but this means that there were more Africans than Europeans for hundreds of years. And, and people haven't thought much about that when we have this narrative of me mestizo Mexicans being native and Europeans, right? So at least for at the beginning, the first um, hundred years of the colonial times, it was mostly Africans and uh, indigenous individuals in Mexico. So of course it has to leave a legacy in, in our genetic makeup. And now we are seeing this also in this, with this ancient viral genes, genomes. So just to um, almost finishing, um, Axel, the, the student um, made this um, study of historical records of viral epidemics in the New Spain. So he looked at uh, autopsy records of this hospital the San Jose Hospital, where three of the individuals uh, were, were part of, of the collection from this hospital. So, uh, so he saw records like this, the fevers were contagious, Greek and black urine, eyes and the body uh, were yellow, swollen liver, yellow liquid, like terrible descriptions, but mo many of these are uh, related or, or indicate liver damage, right? And these are autopsies of coccolistly victims. So we, we actually think we don't know what coccolistly is still, uh, but there are some theories and we kind of believe this could be the case that coccolistly perhaps was not a single pathogen, but uh, many pathogens acting in synergy. And coincidentally, our, the viruses we studied both involve damage to the liver and some of these uh, victims had also uh, uh, liver conditions. So this is just like something to think about and maybe a bit uh, of a speculation, but um, these are the records. So I think I, I don't want to jump into this uh, oral pathogen uh, because I want to leave time for questions. So I, I'd like to stop here. Uh, let me just jump to, um, let me see if I can do this in a smart way. Okay, yeah. I just wanted to show you the wrap up. Uh, so in summary, we reconstructed three uh, parvovirus and one hepatitis B uh, colonial period genomes by applying this targeted capture enrichment method. They all fall within the African genetic variation 
which is consistent with the ancestry of three of the four hosts. The fourth host is had some admixed ancestry, so native likely, uh, with likely European, uh, and this suggests the transmission between people of different ancestries, which again, this is not surprising in any way, but it's interesting we can see it this way. Um, we uh, report the first ancient genotype three genome for, for the pyro, uh, parvovirus and the first in continental Americas. Uh, thanks to the strong stream analysis, we can support that these individuals were born in Africa and brought to Mexico during the transatlantic slave trade. And um, yes, so I'll, the next one is related to the oral pathogen slide, but uh, what we are proposing is that investigating the ancestry, there's no such thing as ancestry of a virus, but kind of the phylogenetic origin of virus and ancestry of individuals, we can start to uh, learn more about social interactions perhaps uh, using yeah, oral pathogens as proxies. So I want to leave that idea there and I'm very happy to discuss it further. Uh, I just want to share with you as well that uh, we, next we, we got funding from different agencies to investigate more in depth host pathogen interactions through ancient DNA. So in this case, we just use the human fraction to investigate ancestry, but we think we can learn way more than that from the host DNA. Um, so we will try to do this uh, with my colleagues Emilia and Flora, uh, with samples from Mexico in, and with my colleague Maria Laura from Argentina in samples from Argentina, Patagonia. So uh, with that, I'd like to finish, but not before thanking everyone in my lab, uh, at, at LEAG, my institute, and from different institutions uh, who have uh, supported this work, especially INA. This is the Anthropology and History uh, Institute in Mexico, and of course the funding agencies. And last but not least, thank you all for joining in and listening to my talk. And I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful, thanks so much, Maria. Thank you. All right, uh, do we have questions from the audience? Yes, uh, I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, yep. uh, Grant McFadden here. Uh, I, I'm interested in the false hit you had with smallpox. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like it came from uh, human genes that had mm -hmm. homology to the smallpox genome. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what those human genes were that gave that false positive? Uh, no, it wasn't an annotated as a gene. It was just a region in the genome that was not a, a gene. It's a, but I remember the, the smallpox heat was a strain called B E A N something numbers. Um, but um, yeah, no, the match to the human genome was not an inner gene in a specific gene. It was just a, a, what seemed to us at least because we didn't look deeper, a random region in the genome. Okay, thanks. Uh, because many genes in small po in all pox viruses have been derived from hosts, so it could have been a, a, a coding sequence, but it sounds like it wasn't. No, and it was a very short region. I think it was like sixty base pairs or something like that. It was very very short, so we couldn't learn much uh, from it. Okay, being this is more. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm. Other questions? Oops. I saw some chat thing. Um, it says, can you comment more on the cause of the bottleneck of genetic diversity after colonization? Uh, well, yes, what I can say is that, you know, that there was this uh, massive population decline and it's attributed uh, in a large fraction to the infectious diseases, but we we know that there was also uh, there were also a lot of other factors like massacres, displacement, uh, stress, if you want, that kind of jointly affected the population in this way, like making the decline this drastic. And the values I show are for Central Mexico, where um, most of the populations in uh, most of the population in uh, Mesoamerica, let's say, uh, was concentrated, and the estimates in other places are not as drastic. Uh, but apparently in central Mexico, it was this drastic, like close to 90% according to some estimates. But uh, I don't know if you want more detail. Okay. 
that's a question I got in the chat. Other questions in person or via chat? We have a few more minutes for questions. Hey, Maria. Hi, Kelly. Um, so with TB, mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing is that there's been sort of a complete replacement of mm -hmm. the, the indigenous forms of the pathogen and what we see now throughout the Americas. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to why um, this is the case or if you're thinking about these questions in your colonial samples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so why was there a replace? So actually, I mean, this is something we would really like to, to study, but we, there is really not much about uh, like present day strains, at least for parvovirus in Mexico, right? There's a couple studies uh, and they do, they're just like, PCR with primers specific to one of the genotypes, right? So they're not asking like, what are the genotypes? Like what's the diversity of genotypes? So it's something we can't um, really see from our, uh, from, with our data. So what we see is that uh, this hasn't been reported in Mexico. So there, this genotype free for the parvovirus, for example. But I think that's more a lack of present day data than anything else uh, for this particular virus. And for hepatitis B, it's actually this uh, genotype A, it's been observed in Mexico and in other places. So with, in modern strains, for example, in Brazil, it's very common. And it has previously been suggested also this kind of association to the transatlantic slave trade. So we don't see there's not a replacement, like at least, I don't think no one has asked directly that's, that question, like is there a replacement or not? But uh, we see, in some places, there is still some of this genotype A. And I don't know like the proportion to say it's been, uh, it, it's a lot, or it's a little bit, but yeah, it's interesting. I don't know, what, what do you think about the replacement? Um, I think that people who had TB when Europeans arrived were the most likely to die. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, that that was the source of the replacement. Mm -hmm. People who are already immunologically compromised were sort of the first to yeah. to go during conquest, and so we sort of just it just lost its footing with the hosts. I have no data to support this, but that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks. Hi. Um, I, I just wanted to elaborate on my question about the uh, genetic uh, bottleneck. Okay. I, I understand that a, a, a large decline in total population will decrease genetic diversity, but was it more than that? For example, is there evidence that uh, there were uh, specific groups, uh, genetic groups that were entirely eliminated or um, that there were genetic vulnerabilities uh, that led to increased mortality, uh, eliminating certain gene groups uh, from the population entirely. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think actually it's been studied uh, with that, the genetic focus, at least in Mexico, like no one has like asked directly this question, like genetically who was more susceptible to die than others? Uh, and well, that's something we uh, we want to investigate. Maybe not directly, a bit indirectly, but looking at the HLA genes. So to look at the immune genes and see if there were some uh, immune genotypes that were more frequent before European colonization and less frequent afterwards. For example, that's one way to see it. But um, like the short answer is. I don't think anyone has like looked at the uh, genetic differences, like specific differences between pre and post contact. We just have the signature like mitochondria white or genome white. We just see the signature of a decrease in the effective population size after colonization. But I don't, we haven't looked like in detail what these genetic differences or the decrease in the genetic diversity entailed. I hope 
that answers sort of your question. We don't know either about like all these specific group, at least from pathogens. I and I, I don't I don't like saying like all these group was like extinct after colonization, right? I don't think that's that's right. Uh, we just know it affected very very dramatically uh, populations in central Mexico. Uh, thank you. That's that's helpful. I mean, the the other um, cause that comes to mind is. Um, uh, were there entire groups like, you know, the residents of a specific valley or uh, mm -hmm. language groups that were just entirely eliminated, whereas, you, you know, maybe, you know, an 80% decline in population in some mm -hmm. groups and 100% decline in population of other groups? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, yeah, I think we would need to ask uh, like archaeologists or anthropologists or historians who follow those uh, more in detail.